Hola, I'm Elias Torres, co-founder and CTO of Drift. You are listening to the American Dream Podcast. Did you know that Drift is part of just 2% of VC-backed startups led by Latin American founders? Well, I'm on a mission to change that. On this show, you will hear from leaders who have achieved their own version of the American Dream. We'll talk about what the process looked like to get there, the obstacles they faced along the way, and the work we still have to do to build a new face of a diverse corporate America. Bienvenidos a todos to the American Dream Podcast. I'm so excited to welcome today's guest, Marta Montoya, to the show. Marta is the founder and CEO of Ag Tools, a dashboard platform for agribusiness operators. Marta lived in Colombia until she was a young adult when she moved to the United States uh, and made the transition from a career as a teacher to a career in agriculture. Today, Marta is going to talk to me about what led her to found her company, the journey they look to create this company, and what she focuses most on today. Marta, thank you for joining the show. Bienvenida. Thank Mucho you. Gusto. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for the opportunity. No, uh, it, it is my pleasure. Uh, I think that um, I want to I want to hear more about. Um, your your upbringing i want to i want i want you to tell me a little bit before we go into the into company stuff you're you're the founder of, of a company in agriculture but let's talk about colombia let's talk about your early days and the people that inspire you to become a um an entrepreneur right tell me about your family and and what gave you the idea to um i guess the, the background and the context for you to attack this problem right so, so I grew up, I, I always come back to like three areas that influenced me who I am. Um, one, my parents owned schools and universities. My father founded the first, with two gentlemen, the first evening school for adults that were challenged financially. The gentleman who drove the truck and had to study chemistry at 7 p.m., which is a challenge. Um, so that was number one. That's where I grew up between schools and universities and um, leader, uh, writers and uh, all these intellectuals sitting down trying to solve the problem of education in the country. The second part, uh, I grew up, I was shift continuously to another city. I grew up in Bogota, but I was sent continuously to a city called Medellin. And in Medellin, what I had was a, a family that had two areas. One, the farms, the coffee farms. So I, my grandpa, the whole family had grew up in the farms. And we, I would hear my, my grandpa complaining or concerned that he never knew how much he would get paid. He just knew he had to harvest, produce, go to the bank, loan money, deliver, and then hope that he would get good money. I never understood that, but I was always involved in that continuous conversation around the table, how we're going to get any money. And then the third one, which I think is one of the most important ones, and I think one of the more impactful ones, I was part of a group called uh, Legion de Maria, Legion of Mary. And I would visit literally every week, three, four different places from prisons to mental uh, hospitals to people with leper that we take care of it. And so I grew up understanding human nature, human, all humans. Um, I had a PhD on human nature because between the school, between the, the, the Legion of Mary. By the time that I come to the United States, I had that background behind me. So that gave me a lot of um, assets to go around the world to talk with farmers. What an amazing uh, upbringing that you had. I love that, that story. It, le leprosy is, is not contagious, right? No. Well, no. Right. It's, they, it's a, no, I, I, they used to say no. I don't know if they were lying, but they said no. But I had, I had to walk. I had to bathe people. Literally, I was right, eight, exactly. nine, so, ten years old. Yeah. But what you hear in the olden times, right? That people were like, how do we live separate? And you couldn't touch them, and they were dirty. And, and people, people, because people thought that if they touched them, they were going to get it, mm -hmm. right? But in reality, you don't, right? Yeah. And so yeah. we used to do it, and, and just because we had to do it, because that's a human thing to do. But but you're right. People were kept very far away. We had to walk literally an hour and a half from the main road to the hospital because it was really far away from human contact yeah no uh, I, I i just i just heard a sermon recently on lepers oh so man look at there you go so now you know <laughs> i'm fresh i'm fresh uh and so i think that um oh, oh wonderful so many questions uh my mother is uh 
is a veterinarian in Nicaragua, and she when she was in Nicaragua, and I grew up. My afternoons after school uh, were at the university. <laughs> so I would play in the lab and in, in the veterinarian and pathology lab, and I would uh, do all the things uh, to 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 learn what happened to the animals, and and then uh, I would hang in the classrooms and just interrupt and and hang out with people there. So that was part of my inspiration. I think I, I like school. And, that, and by the way, I grew up with my father writing all day in the Universidad Nacional of Colombia. I used to hang around that university like you as a little child, which I tell my kids, that was paradise. A huge university. You can go anytime, anywhere, and nothing would happen to you. And you were a little kid. And uh, I would and just, now- yeah. There was there was a, there was a stadium and I would play in the stadiums and the bleachers. I would go into the museums, the labs. There was animals in jars. It was like a little museum. It was like everything. I would just I I, that, I just go around in classrooms so and skeletons offices and, and like nothing. Just, and and my mother would be like, I don't know. I just remember by five p.m., six p.m. I had to get back to get in the car and go. We go leave. Yeah. You know. There you go. Uh, I grew up, hey, people, yeah, free range, free range. Free, I university. love it, yeah, that, that was me too. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And, and, um, and so, and, 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 oh, so much is great stuff. Uh, and, and you, um, and then you moved to the United States. Why did you come? Well, um, a lot of violence going on in the country and we had to go. There is another episode that I hardly mention it, but I understand it very well. And that's how I have learned to deal with corporate America. Believe it or not, we had a um, an overturned boat where I was part of that. So I survived a wrecked um, three days and two days, three days on the water and two nights in the water. Um, I can speak now easy about it. It didn't used to be easy, but I understood from then on how human nature behaves in the middle of a crisis. And it's you first, then you start by the closing closer family members, and you start opening the circle. But I learned that's corporate America. It's first you take care of yourself, then you take care of the closest and the closest. And so I, that that so I, when I tell people, look, I know how to deal with my farmers, but I need to I know how to learn with deal with corporate is that combination of those two uh, many episodes of my life. But that that one in particular is important. So then there is a lot of violence in Colombia. Yeah, that's right. So we went from having my parents having a macro school, macro university, starting to reduce because bombs in Bogota, bombs everywhere, and less people coming to school. Everybody's afraid of leaving, and so we decided that I should just step out and uh, and find a place to kind of open the road. I was the oldest one, and um, landed in California for many reasons, but landed in California, and that's how I started pulling my first brother, and then my parents. And then my little brother, um, like what they call the family chain of migration. Yeah. But I started first bringing everybody legally because I knew illegally it was going to be tough to live here. After I was here, yeah. right? I didn't know that yeah. there was such thing as illegal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, can we just go? No, it's, uh, yeah. My, the family, the, the, the immigration chain, the, the family chain. No, actually, and I'll tell you one thing. My first job, I actually went to my first job application and I gave my passport, which said six months work, six month permit. And they even gave me a job. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know. I just like, okay, I have a job. And then now I look back and like, who accepted me? <laughs> I love, but that, but that is, that is the life of an entrepreneur. That's mm-hmm. why the immigrants and entrepreneurs are so alike, right? Mm-hmm. We, we, we don't know. But we do things. Yeah, we, we just, just don't know. Yeah, we just do. We just do it. And then when they say no, then we go try another thing. You know, I just don't know. I just try again. Uh, um, beautiful. Um, tell us a little bit. Uh, uh, this, what's 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 the what's the pitch? Well, give me the pitch and ag tools. Well, first I'll give you the pitch because there's a second life of mine. Okay, and I oh, think, and oh. I think that's important because we Latinos are very creative. And I want to make sure we don't lose that. Um, I, I, I'm not creative. I wish. I don't, don't say all Latinos are creative because I can't. <laughs> I'm not good at singing. But you I'm know how to inst- dance. Um, mm, even mm. then, because I left. I left Nicaragua. See? Yeah, yeah, Mr. I got the face now. Okay. <laughs> I want to. I want to be the Latino creator. But tell me. Tell me your creative life. So when I landed here, I said I want to do what I wanted to do. Because, again, when you're raised in the family that everybody expects you to do certain things, especially in the Latin American families. You're going to do this. Your father is a chemist. You're a chemist. You're going to take over the school. And when I'm here, I'm like, oh, now I can do what I want to do. I want to be a cartoonist. Okay. 
So I started looking at the books, I read the books, and I found out that the creator of Snoopy, my favorite character, lived in California. I'm like, oh my God, in Santa Rosa, California. Now, think, I mean, I'm in Orange County, Santa Rosa is not like across the street, but for me, it's like, it doesn't matter. It's like, I can take a car. The long story short is I landed at Mr. Charles Shoe's door. I drove all that Friday through the night, landed there, and he took me under his wing, and he... I I did cartoons. I used to do cartoons all the time to teach chemistry and biology because people, I mean, it was easier to teach with cartoons than teaching with a book. And I started um, a career in cartooning uh, parallel to my agricultural life. So it was a second life because in my mind, you couldn't make a living doing cartoons. There was no such thing. So, but I'm going to keep up with my cartooning hobby. Little did I know that there was a lot of money to be made, especially when I met Mr. Schultz. And he has three people in his office and $2 billion in sales. I'm like, how do you do that? I mean, how can three people make so much money, right? I mean, sell so much. And I learned the licensing industry, which is giving the rights. And long story short, I started doing an international agricultural development because that's the thing I should do because you never know if I don't have a job, right? And then cartooning. And I became a cartoonist and I became a syndicated cartoonist. And I had a comic strip. La Opinión in Los Angeles was the first one who published me. I'll never forget that, Monica Lozano, my, my angel uh, person. And then from then on, it was over um, um, 800 newspapers around the world. And I did cartooning and licensing. But again, agricultural development all over the world. And my life was around that. And I will do the second part of it. And um, the long story short is that I, I always had the two passions, the cartooning, but the agricultural because of the farming, the food, the supply chain, the farmers, and so on and so forth. When the world starts changing, where everything is going more animation, more tiptoeing world, more a little bit more violent of cartooning, less soft and cute, that's when I said, I think the face is done. Let me... Focus completely in this. And so that's when I'm, I'm in my world of agriculture fully in the last, since 2011 or 12. And that's when I decided to do our tools. You will see a lot of cartooning in that. That's the combination of the two worlds. Because now we're talking with, with farmers around the world that have very little education or little degree of education. So now my cartoons are the characters that talk about data to our farmers. So it's the combination of the two worlds. And that's that's when I said, okay, I can do this. I can do the technology because I know technology. I am software developer too, like my brothers. And they are now combined cartooning with it. And that's why we kind of are successful because I, I look at life in a data from a different point of view. Oh my God, that is amazing. The amount of perspective and talent and... Um... And, and I mean, Kurt, Kurt, what I know, right, is that storytelling is one of the most fundamental things in business, right? Yeah. And so you, you can do it visually, right? And so that means that to, to, to be able to synthesize the story with images in such few numbers of images, right, uh, it's, it's powerful, mm -hmm. right? And, and then you're basically speaking universally, right, to, to, to farmers because then you have to translate a lot less but make a huge impact, right? Because exactly. you can teach them. And that's, that's, that's incredible how all those things come together. Uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> that's a, I'm already, I'm already super excited. Um, and, and I love the passion that you have, right? It's, it's, it's mind boggling how Latin America, you know, it's like, how do we elevate Latin America and its resources, right? For people to make money, because I, I say the word, I feel like we be we are exploited, right? You know, it's just so unfair, right? That that what you said, you know, your grandfather goes, and and and, and he probably did better than most, right? Mm -hmm. Successful in in, in 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 coffee, but you know, I, I pay six seven dollars for a cup of coffee here, right? And 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 not much of that is going uh, to to him and, and your family, right? And, and, and so, like, and to have no clue, like you said, it just you just you made it so real to me to think. You, I my understanding is in my countries, in our countries, to get a loan is not an easy thing. No. And, and 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 for him to put everything on the line, right, to go and get a loan, land, produce, grow, 
uh, the risk of the weather of the war, you know, a it bomb strikes. comes in. They, they they steal they steal the coffee. They say we well, give it to us. Whatever, right? He's living under that pressure. Everybody's under and, that pressure. Yes. Yeah, and he gets his product taken away, right? By by somebody, and then they just come back and say it's like complete gangster, right? It's like it's like here you go. We give you. We can give you this, and and then you have no way to fight because you don't have a marketplace. You don't have means of taking it out there. You don't. You cannot get quotes. You cannot get competitive bids. You don't control the entire pipeline, and 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 so so I'm assuming that that's what you're solving. That's what I'm solving. Given the data, it, it's interesting. There's one thing I like your audience to know about the industry because this is very people people get shocked when I tell them that. In the United States, to sell fruits and vegetables, you have to have a license of the Department of Justice. People think it's Department of Agriculture, but there's a reason behind it. The Department of Justice protects the farmers in the United States. So that means that you're a farmer, and I'm a person who comes and buys from you at $5, and you said it was $7. Tomorrow morning, you call that line, and you... Tell them what I just did to you, and I have 30 days to solve it. And it's your word against my word. But 51% the farmer word is 51%. So it's protecting the farmers here. That doesn't exist in our Americas. It's only in the United States, right? And so hopefully that will change because the law should always protect the farmer because the farmer is always in disadvantage, okay? So I tell many of the farmers around the Americas and anywhere I talk Get a license in the United States. Get a what they call PACA license. Get a Department of Justice license. Because then the, the middleman will behave differently. Because they know that you can you have a mechanism to protect yourself. Now, our countries don't have that. But having the USA, and if you're selling to USA, that's an important one. And then the second part that is also important is the fact that every, for the last 20 some years, every time that a president was going to run, I always would ask who's going to be in charge of the hemisphere. And do they understand agriculture? And the answer was, uh, it's John Smith who went to Harvard, who went to this, who never in his whole life went to a farm. Yeah, his great-grandfather went to farm. Well, guess what? Finally, this administration, and I think it's been a push now, has realized that food insecurity is a real thing in the world and that the world is going to need the Americas, period, because I'll give you the reality. Africa doesn't have dripping I irrigation. So we have to feed them continuously. And the labor is nomad. It moves all the time. So it's not a very steady labor force. Uh, Russia, well, even if they were up and running and they're semi-up and running, is wheat and corn and rice. They don't have vegetables, fruits, and healthy food. Europe is reducing more and more farmers because of regulations and labor and all that. China doesn't have enough food for themselves. So they have to go out there and buy. And India hardly can produce for themselves as Indonesia, okay? The Americas is where everybody's coming to buy, get the food now for the world, literally the world. We're becoming the salad bowl of the world, the continent, the whole continent. But guess what? Finally, the world is waking up and the Biden administration and everybody's waking up like, whoa, 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 let's take up this Central America, the triangle. There's a whole thing behind that. Let's take up Mexico. Let's take up because this is where the food is going to be coming. Or we're importing 65% of the bell peppers come from Mexico into the United States that we consume. And I can start giving you all the data, and we're almost 80, 70 some percent of all the fruits and vegetables are coming from only anywhere by the United States. Wow. This is fascinating information. And it's the healthiest thing because we're starting to eat yeah. less corn and wheat and rice. And by having all these fruits and vegetables, we have to bring them from Latin America, Mexico down. That's I mean, yeah, because a lot of the wheat goes in Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 That's wheat and corn. Right. But people are not eating as much wheat and corn. Uh, new generations are realizing wheat and corn is not that healthy. Once in a little bit, but not every single day, wheat and corn. But I love bread. We love bread, but we can only eat a couple of times a month, a week, not every day, like we used to. Yeah, that's why, we, that's why the video is only from here up. <laughs> up and up. Yeah. Because I don't eat, I eat more than once a day, um, and so wow, this is this is an incredible opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and and we need to equip, right? So you're equipping the farmers in Latin America. 
So t tell me about the seasons. How, how does so, so, like, so what happens is that, so when I was doing these development crops around the world, and, and I'm called to do one in the United States, my first shock was that overseas, I understood that the farmers had no data. That I got it. I understand. End of the story. But I landed in the United States, and I thought the farmers had the data, and they didn't have the data either. I'm like, oh, so this is a global problem. Farmers without data are always going to be in disadvantage. So let's start working on this. So the idea is that if I'm a farmer and I'm going to farm 10 acres or one acre or 100 acres, if I look at the data for the last 20 years in seconds, then I can see the growth. Should I be planting more strawberries or should I be planting more blackberries? Should I be doing red peppers or green peppers? Because the market is showing the data. The data is showing what's growing and the prices. So I have even a, a wonderful lady who has no, uh, no degree, nor elementary, doesn't read, but she knows numbers. And she used to do literally half an acre of tomatoes. It was tomatoes. And the box of tomatoes, $15, $20. No, it's $10 to $15 a box. And she looks at the data and she looks that seller is $25 to $30 a box. Hmm. So she keeps one lane, one half of the half, and the other one celery. So now her balance sheet changes. She doesn't know what the balance sheet means, but now she, because she's actually, she sells to the Apple, uh, the Apple uh, cafeteria uh, in, up in San Jose. But now she had make more money because now she's selling celery instead of just tomatoes. So that data impacts a little farmer who has an education, imagine on a larger scale, because now they can see better things faster. Uh, and I, like I said to people, once you cut a strawberry at six in the morning, if you haven't sold it by 10 a.m., you have to throw it away. You just can't keep it. Nobody will buy next day. Nobody will buy a strawberry harvested today, next day. I do. I'm sure. No? No. 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 In the market, nobody will buy it because they know that the shelf life is gone already on that strawberry. If I oh. harvest it today and I put them in the, in the coolers, if I don't sell it by, by today at 10 a.m., nobody will buy it tomorrow. This, this is no market. Our whole place is fresh strawberries every, every day. day. Mm -hmm. Everything is fresh. I mean, potatoes are a little bit longer, apples are a little yeah, bit longer, potatoes. but it's all fresh. So, so, knows how this. so building the software around special, what we call specialty crops. Specialty crops are fruits, vegetables, nuts, herbs, and and uh, plants. Building the software around that and the the agility of that, then we could put as uh, some customers are asked for tea or coffee or cocoa or meat or eggs because this is the most complex one anything goes in there and so 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 tell so so what's the elevator like what what is when somebody who buys who pays you right uh and what how do they use your product so um uh, uh let's say a, um, a farmer like that like the lady i just mentioned she immediately can change and shift uh gears on small crops that are uh, that can be moved faster. On big buyers, let's say the second largest, uh, the second biggest buyer of avocado in the world, literally is in the United States. Now they can see when trees produce the most amount of avocados, so they can do guacamole promotions. So instead of pushing a guacamole promotion in May, they pro pro push for a guacamole promotion in August. Why? Because now there's more avocado left in the trees. And then the farmers don't have to throw away those avocados anymore because now there's a guacamole promotion. So this is how a buyer can now see better and buy differently and help the farmers not to have on, because it happened until last year. August is when many trees let, the, the, the farmers let the avocados fall down from the tree because there's no market. It's cheaper to let it die than harvest that. And so now that those buyers, which is, again, second and first buyers of the world, now they can manage better that crop, not because of the farmers, but because of the buyers. Wow. I have, a, I have an uncle that works, in, that he was in Ecuador, oh, my, my wife's uncle that lives in Ecuador and that works on a, on tracing tools mm -hmm. for, for fish, right? That you want to know the exact route of where this fish has been, right, from the moment it came out. Refrigeration locations, days, and the traceability. Kind of traceability. Yes. There you go. Yes. Is this similar? No, because we don't trace the products. We trace the market. We 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 go to let's say Ecuador. 
how much is exported every day of fish to which countries, what type of uh, frozen, not frozen, cut, not cut. And that's it. That's the market. That's, that's, that's what we bring in. Why? Because everybody has to report that to some government entity. So we grab that data from the governments. We clean it. We scrape it. We put it in the system. That's number one. And then the second thing that is important is the weather patterns. Um, the whole world, when they created weather um, for agriculture, was created for wheat, corn, and rice. That was the middle of this country, Midwest, right? So what happens is that with doing that, if you have a tomato, what? how is a tomato compared whether with uh, wheat or rice and corn, right? So what we have is proprietary. We have, for the last year and a half, collected data on all these 526 commodities from around the world and put the weather patterns of that product in that region and how it behaves. And, 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 and so, so you have the data, and so... Are the buyers the ones paying you to be to have access to that information, or the or the producers? Both, both. Okay. And but different ways. The farmers want just the report at four o'clock in the morning, while the buyers want access to the whole data, right? And there's another issue, Elias, and I was just discussing this with one of my team members. It's not that people want the data given completely; is they want to understand how to read the data, right? So we have, an, as a professor that I was, I have a very heavy um, element in my company of training people. The professor in me comes on. And I have Juanita, who I said, if you have to spend 100 hours with an, a farmer or with a, with a buyer, do it. Because that is impacting our earth. That is impacting them financially. And we don't want to lose our farmers. We already lost almost 400,000 farmers in the United States in the last three, four years. We can't afford to lose farmers from Mexico down. We have to. Keep what we have and keep what we have down there because that's who's going to feed the world. But I mean, you think, I mean, in a way, we also have to grow it, you know, in Latin America? Mm -hmm. We have to know. It's that we're wasting three, 30% we're throwing away in the farm. 30%? Between farm and distribution center, we're throwing away 4,900 truckloads in the United States, 62,500 in the world daily. Daily. So it's not that we have to plant more. We just have to use better what we have. Wow. Because there's soil, there's not enough soil, Elias, to keep planting. There's no more. We can't. Oh. Co Colombia has an issue right now because avocados are such a hot property. We're, we're cutting more trees in Colombia to put more avocados. So we're deforesting the land, right? So no, 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 no. Let's just use better than what we have so we don't have to cut more. If we use 10, 15% more of what we're throwing away before the farm, before right. the distribution center, we already can fit the one uh, eight hundred uh, million people. I'm assuming that that's where probably the government can help. Like if they've put rules that if you use these tools like yours, uh, but you're not allowed to deforest anymore. If we could control that, right? Right, right. And say until you use these tools and increase your efficiency to this. And incentive. You know, I would say the word I learned this in the United States: incentivize with tax benefits, uh, grants, and things of that nature, which they are doing. For Central America, there's a huge deployment of funding in the, those that famous triangle from from the White House down there to increase the farming, increase. The what triangle? What triangle? The, it's called El Salvador, uh, it's El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. It's called the triangle, and oh. and that triangle is to avoid immigration into the United States and to keep more people in the country. And by that is with more labor, with more factories opening, with more benefits in the country, so they stay in the country. Why is Nicaragua not there? I'm from Nicaragua. Because of the legal, with the issues right now with the president. The even, president? Even El Salvador, is, uh, it's still in the triangle, but uh, kind of like, yes, semi, yes, semi, no. Yeah, it's, it's the problemas, problemas. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh my my president. But Nicaragua, president. Nicaragua, I know Nicaragua very well. I know the beautiful mangoes, the coffee, the bananas. I mean, it's amazing. Cacao. Cacao. I mean, the land is an amazing land of production. If we will produce in Nicaragua, we're done. I mean, we're between those four countries. We can feed the whole world. Literally. Literally. And I mean, oh, wow. and I know the industry. Yeah, and, and people, yeah, people like, we, we ate so simply, but like, 
the food here is so bad, you know, compared to the, the, the food that we had over there. So simple, so basic, but so healthy. Yeah. I remember going to the to the market with my mother in a sack, you know, just shopping, carrying that. I was a little boy and my mother, the beginning of the trip was great because the sack was empty. And then by the end, it was so heavy. And I'm just following her and negotiating and, you know, haggling, you know, how much for this avocados, how much for this tomatoes, getting, learning how to negotiate exactly. from, from the early age. That That, that yeah. is... Your mama is the farmer across the Americas. You see what I mean? Don't underestimate yeah. them. They're sharp like a cookie. I mean, they know one plus one, three, four, five, seven, eight, twenty, and you're like, what? <laughs> they're hardly getting out the calculator to do the thing. They're doing it all in their heads. So I always say to people that don't understand farmers, be careful with a farmer when you're in front of them with numbers because they'll take you out. They'll wipe you out in seconds. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I totally remember that. I can picture that. It's like. You know, making change, the money, this. They had those those aprons with all those millions of pockets, and they were just filled with cash everywhere. And they're like, and coins and this, and it's just like, boom, 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 um, weighing things, right? Calculating. I remember those whole scales with the strings, and it'd be like, this is this much of. And there's no different. It's no different today, Elias. Still today, going on in our country. So, so when all these technologies, ag tech companies come up and we're going to do this and the robots, I'm like, mm, okay, hang in there, guys. <laughs> the, maybe maybe here in Southern California, maybe it looks very flat. Have you gone to Nicaragua? Have you gone to Guatemala? You see the roads, you see there's no electricity everywhere. There's no internet everywhere. <laughs> I don't know if this ag tech world is there, right? So... That is one that I, I'm always bringing up because I used to, let's say, if I had to take a tractor down to Latin America, I would used to go and look for the oldest one here. A brand new, yeah. if something went wrong, I would be stuck with that thing because I couldn't get the part. You know, what I want to inspire people, I'm an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur, right? And and I'm showing, this is such a great example of, of, of a Latina entrepreneur, right? Using all of her experiences and her upbringing into building a tech company in the United States. And, and, <laughs> and, and you've been to Stanford nonetheless, right? So t- tell me a little bit Love about it. that. Tell, tell me about entrepreneurship, right? Tell me about how do we encourage more Latinos to to use their talents to create companies for, for, for social impact? I mean, you know. I'm going to answer it because, with a question to you. With your mom, your mom will do anything. She will get into any room, into any place for you and your family, right? She would. She didn't care. She she bugged how ugly or strange she looked. And sometimes we were like, "Oh, mama, no hagas eso, please, mama." Embarrassing. No, no, no. She didn't care. She had to take care of the kids. That was the mother of the Latina mother, right? That's us Latinas. We cannot lose that when we come to this country. I mean, one thing is to be nasty, but one thing is to be our mothers. Hey, I want to know this. Explain to me what I do here. How do I fill this form? Can I go to Stanford? How? Do, what do I need to do to be to go to Stanford? Oh, you, there's a program for you. Oh, where is the program? Do I have, can I pay, not pay? No, you don't have to pay. You see what I mean? Ask. Keep going. Don't stop. Be your mama. Be your grandmother. Elegant, but still be that. Um, and, and you will get through because at the end of the day, we have three things. We have that, that persistence that hopefully will bring it up from Latinas. We have knowledge and creativity of the industries. Some women have been doing, I'm just going to give you one. I start cleaning buildings in this country and I became the best cleaner because I will do like the best thing. I was customer service, right? Customer service, perfect this, perfect that. And my, my gentleman, gentleman that I used to clean their offices, they'll give me books and papers and articles because I will ask them. One of them was a banker and I'll ask him, how do you get a loan here? And things of that nature. And then the third thing and more important is just find the passion of that item that you like. Um, even sewing. It's a whole industry by itself. And make sure that you, you work walk that path and try to technify that. Because the world is moving towards that. There's no going back. We have to look into how we technify whatever we do. And uh, the recipe of the grandmother, the sewing of that, the cleaning of a building differently. Well, um, in my case, it was me dealing with farmers and buyers. That was what I was doing every day. How do I make it more simple so everybody has the same data? And there it goes. And then recruit. 
first look at the family members who have talent. Like in my case, I hired my two brothers. <laughs> I brought them, so they had to pay back. But find those people that have the talent and explain, look, you're going to be a stepping stone for a little bit. And then eventually I'm going to bring people who know how to run the companies. So there's no um, uh, hard feelings later on. What a great advice. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned the same thing. And to me, it was Latino growing with my mother and in a communist country, right, where everything is complicated. Like, how did you get your passport? How do you get your your birth certificate? Like, it's like you got to go from this place to the other and ask and, and they say, not here, not here. Go over there. Find out. Talk to so-and-so. Is that stand in this line, then go to this line, then get this ticket. You know, it's like, and here, people are just entitled or just spoiled or just like, I just want it immediately delivered to me. Just I like push the button. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and and so the people that can solve problems are the ones that can become entrepreneurs. 100%. And if the new generation is losing it, well, we'll, we'll always will need immigrants then because those are the ones that come with the hustle. Uh, right. To, to be a problem solver. But DNA is there, though. I think there's also a DNA aspect of it. And mm-hmm. like my daughter is like, can't stop her. Can't stop her. She's, there you go. She's poor. And that, it's the DNA. Is the DNA of the grandma, right? It's, it's the. It's the. D- she has my grandmother's DNA, my mother's DNA. I have her DNA, and then my daughter now has that DNA. There you go. Leave me with a thought here. There, there's a quote that you said that food science is a community. Is a community. Food science is a community. We talk a lot about the power of community in this podcast. You're part of this community. Um, what can you talk to me? T- tell me about that. We finally realize that what we eat is how we are healthier and we avoid going to doctors in the future. Doesn't mean that we're not going to die, that we haven't solved, but let's make the best out of our life. So food is essential and how we manage our food intake and how we manage our food neighborhood and how we grow better farming around us, how we entice everybody around us, how we use less salt in our recipes, simple things like that, all the way till create their own um, uh, gardens locally, uh, get involved in recipes on a restaurant. Literally, food is, for me, has been the best industry in the world. That's why I never abandoned it besides the cartooning because I, I knew that when recessions hit, people has, still have to eat. And so food is, it's, it's essential. It's a science, but it's a, but it's a simple science for all of us. And especially as Latinas and Latinos, we are around the food, our food. Our food, but a real food, we learn how to cook from scratch in our culture. And we need to make sure we stay or go back to that from scratch. Eat less, but eat from scratch versus eat more and processed foods. That is the, the, the secret. So start by using less salt. Our kids are even now more in tune with that than we were. Because when we came, we were in a survival mode. We just had to eat to survive. Yeah. Because I came and I didn't have anything. So I had to, whatever I could eat, I would eat. And on top yeah. of that, I came to a country that had new things. So I remember my, my Rocky Road ice cream, which, because I never had Rocky Road in my life, right? I mean, and I look at it like, should I eat all that Rocky Road, okay? But my point is that it was survival mode. Now the kids, my I see my younger friends, kids, and my kids, and they're much more in tune on this whole health uh, thing. And yeah. I like that. They they are, but uh, but but the beautiful art of cooking from scratch in our culture and our community that that still needs to be taught, you know, and yes. and brought back. Reverse, and, come back. Reverse, like my mother. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been having some great moments. My 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 daughter um, was at her boyfriend's, and she called my wife to do the arroz con camarón, shrimp with rice recipe with the sofrito at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, we cook together now. And, and so she they, they're like, my son asked my, my my mother when she was visiting to do arroz con leche and, 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 and how to make it. And it's like, we'll do it over Zoom and, and this. So, so I think I'm doing that with the kids. And it's going to like, happen. It's going, it has to happen, right? But it, it's, it's, food is incredible. But we got to, Enjoy not just eating bad food and just for sake of eating, but making it and and and, and eating healthy, right? I, I think that's a great, great piece of advice. We need our health. And 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 if anybody is listening on the entrepreneurial side, look at food as our industry. It's one of the best industries. It's not easy, 
but it's a it's an industry that survives every recession. We always need to eat, no matter what. And 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 people are investing and paying more for eating better, right? So mm-hmm. so the, the opportunity is there. So thank you so much. I've learned so thank much. You, yeah. Love to to learn about other industries, not just boring tech software, you know, for B two B. But instead, this is about our Latin America, feeding the world, eating mm-hmm. healthy, and, and supporting the the farmers, right? That they're, they're cooking they're, from they're, scratch and cooking from scratch. Yeah, that will force the that will force the supply chain to bring more natural foods into the supermarkets and the systems. If you're continuously going to ask, oh, do you have this raw? No, we have it. No, I want it raw. So you start pressuring from the bottom up to the supply chain. Wow, we can. That, that's that's real ways that we can make an impact, right? There you go. 100%. To ourselves and to the whole country and the world. Oh wow, cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Mucho gusto. Can ask, thank you so much for come for allowing me to be part of the the journey that we're get, coming on. Thank God to this life. Yeah, we we is is we're educating and we're sharing what we've learned and who we are and what we do so others can do the same. That's the goal of this of this podcast and achieving okay. our own American dream. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the American Dream podcast. Make sure to hit subscribe so you never miss when a new episode drops. If you like this episode, please leave a six star review wherever you listen to your podcast. And if you're interested in learning more about my American Dream mission, subscribe to my newsletter linked in the show notes.